Um, I'm going to talk about skills and skills gaps, and, and it actually relates sort of the things we've heard about this morning. Um, that's me. Please, please feel free to tweet if you disagree or if you agree. Obviously, include all the hashtags and the digital 2015. Um, so why am I here? Well, um, yeah, the security skills gap. That's what I'm going to talk about. But first about me, because I'm kind of one of your typical security guys in that I have no security training whatsoever. I'm a chemist by official degree and PhD. Um, but over the years, I've moved into IT and I've moved into security. And now currently, as it says up there, I have lots of letters after my name and I do lots of stuff, some of which is interesting, some of which is like sticking pins in your eyes, but you have to do it. Um, <laughs> about us, and this is why I'm actually here. Our vision, we have 110,000 people around the world who hold one of our certifications. Our vision is to make the world, or certainly the side world, a better place to do business, to enjoy yourselves, to buy stuff, whatever it may be. And part of that is about how do we make sure that we build cyber world better? Not necessarily more securely, just better. And that's, that's part of the whole piece. So what we do every two years, we do this. And this is the actual physical document. We work with a company called Frost & Sullivan, and we go out and talk to as many people as we can globally about skills. What's your job like? What do you wish you really had? What do you wish you could have in three years' time? And from that, we pull out some data. And we use that to help people, recruiters, organizations, individuals get better and hopefully find the right sort of people. So, what do you know about today? Well, you've heard all this. You've actually seen some of this happen right in front of you. You've seen phishing. You've seen networks being scanned. You've heard about people who are able to hack into the, the computers that run Amazon and so on. We know all this, but this just puts everything in perspective. So these are the top three things that keep people awake who work in information security every night. And actually, some of those have nothing to do with computers. Some do. It's an interesting mix. The consequences are, of course, if you get things wrong. Now, Jason has a great slide where we, he actually shows that 9 billion records of individuals have been breached last year. That's 2 billion more people than are alive. So I'd like to know who's getting done at least twice. But this is what happens when we as an industry, when we as companies get it wrong. And we've all heard about the American government being hacked. That is the American government hack of last week. In the scale of things, it ain't really that big, is it? Not when you start looking at things like the eBay hack and Target and all the ones we've heard of before. If you get it wrong, it's expensive. And each of the customers who had a record breached has to be told and notified under US, not yet European law, although the Dutch have just brought it in to law. It costs about $150 to inform one person that they might have been breached. So who's good at maths here? Anybody? Just do 70 million times $150 and work out how much that really costs Target before we start talking about the loss of sales, the firing of the CEO, the loss of all the IT guys, right? This has real-world consequences. Some of this comes down to what I'm going to now talk about. First thing is, what we do is not about IT. We actually work across every single industry vertical you can think of, and probably then some. So different environments need different skills. You wouldn't necessarily have a marketer who's very good at online marketing and put them into print without training them or expecting them to learn for a particular period of time. But also, we have a huge amount of stuff to cover. Some guys in InfoSec are really good at doing this. Jason's one of them. He's very good at the old keyboards and the hacking and the, the really deep technical stuff. Other people are incredibly good at running stuff, writing the guidance for other people to follow. But between that, there is a huge continuum of knowledge, experience, and education. I have yet to meet anybody in the information security field who says they can do everything you see on this slide. And if I would, I don't think I'd believe them. I certainly can't. <laughs> and I freely admit that on this line, I'm definitely going up. 
I'm not a techie. I've never been a techie. I know how to do technical stuff, but that's a different story. But when it comes down to it, right now, people I know, the people I work with, have a real problem. Six out of 10 of them can't find the right people. If you work in information security and you're well known and you're very good, you can write your own paycheck right now. And you can move every year or two into you know, really interesting jobs. Half the people I know can't even find people. Where are they? Where are these hundreds of thousands of computer science graduates who haven't got jobs? Where are they? We don't know. And then we have a real problem is that unfortunately, and I do have a face for radio, I've heard the joke before, uh, most of the people who work in my industry are looking like me. And that's really worrying. Because most of the people on the other side are under 30. The hackers, the criminals, the, you know, the guys who use computers as a tool to commit crime are young. So we have a real disparity here, real mishmash. So our biggest problem today is that we can't find the right people with the right skills. And we'd love to have more people in the industry, we'd have to have more people with more skills, and we just, we can't find them. We have a pipeline problem, we have a real gap. And it's fine moaning about it, but what do you do? Well, we've actually done a couple of things. We've talked to the IT profession. This is BCS, uh, Harvey Nash and KPMG, it says there, they can't find the right people. So I work in a small subset of IT, I can't find the right people, yet I work in an industry that can't find the right people. What chance do I have of getting people in to work for me? The odds are stacked against us, very much so. So what we do is we say, well, what do we need? That's the number of people that we estimate are needed in information security over the next five years. Give or take, it's about 300,000 in the UK. What an opportunity for the education, the training, and the companies in this country to fill. 300,000 extra people. And the jobs are well-paying. Three quarters of those jobs will require a degree or equivalent, which means they're gonna start work at least or above the national minimum wage of 23, 24,000 pounds. For the really lucky people, once you get up to manager and above, I know some people who are on five, six figure salaries, six figure salaries. Seriously good jobs for very good people. But okay, so what do we really need? Well, you know, it's IT, right? So we need nerds. We need geeks. We need dweebs. I love that word. I love that word. I also like the fact that technically, according to my wife, I'm somewhere across there. Apparently. I keep saying to her, I'm not obsessed about anything apart from obsession itself. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but what do we need? Do we need those? Or maybe do we need something else? Well, what, we, what we've learned from our studies, and what I've learned from talking to people in the industry, is actually we want people who can talk well. People who can communicate people who actually don't look at their shoes when they talk to other people. I actually went to an organization, I can't tell you when it was, and I was at the IT and information security department, and they were going to go and talk to the senior managers on the Monday. And I actually had to take them out and buy them a suit and get their hair cut and get their shoes polished and do everything so when they went into the boardroom, they didn't look like a bunch of techies. Because the minute they walked in looking like a bunch of techies, the board would have gone, yeah, right next. People who can communicate, people who understand where they are. We need people who can solve problems. IT, information security, is actually about solving problems, using tools, computers, programming languages. If you can look at a problem, break it down, solve it, and then rebuild the answer, analysis and synthesis, it's a fantastic, fantastic um, thing to have, and it's also one of the things we most need. Just so you know, the black bars are the UK, and the green bars are the global. We need people to understand risk. What is risk? What is business risk? How do you measure it? How do you communicate the risk of IT breaking down and going, and the damage it could do to a company? How do you um, talk about the damage an attack can cause? Well, you need to understand risk 
how it works, it's a component, and you need to be able to communicate it. You get the gear picture, right? And of course we need technology skills, but they're not as important as the other ones, and they're not as much in demand as well. So we don't need people like that, although they're very useful, we need people like that. That's anybody. Anybody is capable of doing our work with the right education and the right training. Because what we really need is what every other business needs, every other business function needs. People who are articulate, people who can solve problems, people who are curious. Jason may have told you, but I'll repeat the story. The reason why Jason's in this business is he was curious about how stuff worked. That's why I'm in this business. I was curious about how stuff IT worked. And then you take it from there. Well-educated, what does that mean? Doesn't mean you have to have lots of letters after your name. It means you have to have a firm grounding in the principles of how stuff works. And in security, our three principles are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. They are drilled into you as a security, bar, security guy. As a chemist, I can still remember oil rig. Oxidization is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. I haven't done chemistry for 20 years, but I learned the principles, and I learned them well. If you teach the principles properly, that's what I mean by well-educated. We need people who learn, who continue to learn, who are hungry to learn throughout their lives. Hackers collaborate, they share. When they learn something, they post it on the hacker notice boards, on the dark web, they talk to each other, they learn. If you don't learn in your current profession or in the information security profession, you become a dinosaur very quickly. So we need people who are committed to constantly learning, to constantly stretching themselves. And that could be, of course, learning new skills, such as the ability to talk, to present, the ability to hack the ability to use some of these tools. It doesn't matter. It's the fact they're primed, they're hungry for extra knowledge. We need people who are well motivated, because sometimes this, this can get pretty tough. When you get hauled in front of the board at four o'clock on a Sunday morning, and they're panicking, and they want you to tell them what to do, you have to have an ounce of motivation and an ounce of grit in you. you also, we also need people who are prepared to try doesn't matter if you fail, it only matters if you don't learn from your failure. And we need people who can do, people who can code, people who can present, people who can explain risk and who can then go and make a difference in an organization. Whether it be themselves on their own, being passionate about something, or it's someone who can write the next app, it doesn't matter. We need people who have many of those characteristics. You probably won't get all of them in one person. If you do, hold on to them and never let them go. But that's the sort of thing. Every industry wants exactly the same sort of people. We are no different. And that's one of the key messages. We are no different. So what, how are we going to do this? Well, there's education. I could guarantee that most of the 15, 16 year olds going through the education system right now and their parents have no idea that there is a career path in information security. They have no idea of the sort of skills, of the sort of rewarding jobs, of the sort of job market there is out there. And if we don't start people at 15, 16 and get them interested, they will never join this profession or they'll never understand anything about it, which is just as worse in some ways. So yeah, we need to catch them young. We need to get them doing the, the European driving license and stuff like that. We need to get them interested. The world is going to be basically digital. It's going to rely on computers. And if you don't have an understanding of how they work, even at the most basic level, people will get marginalized very, very quickly. Then we need to pull them through. We need to pull them through into things such as apprenticeship uh, frameworks great way of bringing people in who aren't necessarily academically talented, who don't want to go to university. Bring them in through the apprenticeship programs. Then, of course, we can use the internships. We support the, inter the, the uh, internship program. Um, it's one of the best things I think we can do, is to give people a chance. Let them work on a project for three months. Let them understand the business, understand what we do, how we do it. They may walk away and decide they don't want to. 
but at least they're making an informed decision. If we don't show them, they will never know. Then, of course, we can move into the HNCs, the, 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 the certifications, the, the, the qualifications people can get while they're actually working. And yeah, we should be talking about HNCs and the value of these things. All too often, we forget about HNCs and HNDs and on-the-job training. And actually, that's a great route because people can then learn an environment that best suits them. And the same is true of the HNDs as well. And by the way, the, the, the symbols on the side are merely examples of, of organizations and professional bodies that support this sort of thing. Then, of course, there's the degrees. There are 80,000, give or take, computer science students in the UK. They are the people from which we draw in information security. A number, not the vast proportion, but a number of our, of our um, uh, intake. But most of the time, they don't actually get taught anything about security. Yet these are the guys who have probably the biggest impact when they, when they go out into the world of work. So we've actually, in terms of ISC squared, we've been working with the universities, the Russell Group, the Council of Professors and Heads of Computing, Cabinet Office, the BCS. And as from September, every UK degree will teach the fundamentals of cybersecurity as a mandatory component of the three-year course. And that's the book. I haven't got a copy with me. You can download it. But this is important because this is addressing the skills gap the best way we know how. Getting people trained. There is also another side, which Jason and I will cover in a minute. And then, of course, GCHQ. Uh, they look at the master's degrees. They're looking at the much more creating the highly specialized, highly trained, highly educated uh, cybersecurity people at the sort of top of the, the educational chain. So there are many ways we can fill the skills gap in. We can go literally from O-level, GCSE. That shows my age O-level, doesn't it? <laughs> we can go right from there, right through to someone who's 25, 26 plus doing a master's. We can take them on an educational journey. Yes, it takes a long time, but there is actually a mechanism by which we can fulfill the skills gap and we can fulfill it using what is still widely regarded as one of the better educational processes in, in the world, especially at the, U, especially at the university end. So that's good news, because we actually know what we want, we know who we want, and we know of a process by which we can get it. The real key is making it all happen, and that's what we're trying to do. There is, of course, another side. There is the educational side, and I never would ever devalue that, obviously, because I have a background going through the education system. But there's also another way of doing stuff. I hold a professional certification. I am a CIWSP. That's what my company, IC Squared, does. That's those 110,000 people around the world. Jason holds it. Colin holds it. There's probably, I've actually seen a couple of other people wandering around with a badge, the older badge, the, the circle badge that I, I'm wearing. So I know people have got it here. There are many others. It doesn't matter which one people have. It's a way of validating your work knowledge, your work experience, your application of the knowledge you have, you have got. And, of course, it's great for, a, for employers because they know there's an independent process by which someone can, can validate their experience. Now, certifications normally have several components. There's a body of knowledge, there's um, an education piece, there's an exam, and there's work experience. Just because students don't have the work experience doesn't mean they can't be taught the knowledge and the basics of the certification to prepare them for professional, professional certification during their careers. This is another way, especially if we go into foundation degrees or we go into um, you know, the, sort of the less academic end of the spectrum, such as the diplomas, etc. We can push students through a professional route so that when they leave with their apprenticeships, completed their HNDs, they are ready to join professional bodies, which marks them out again as having the skills and the knowledge which will help them get the jobs they want. So for, our, I mean, for us, we have a very simple process where we have, you have to have you have to know your stuff. There's no way around it. If you want to get, join a professional body, whether it be medicine or 
the, uh, the BCS or, or ourselves, you have to know your stuff. You have to have experience. But if students are working and part-time, they are accruing those years' experience as they're getting their education. So when they come out at the end, bingo. They come out at the end with a recognized academic qualification and they have a recognized professional cert. So then we talk about, you know, they have to pass an exam. That's the objective method of testing what they know and what they have done. It's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but at least it's objective. Uh, in our case, we have to, you have to be endorsed. So people who know you, who already hold the certification, have to turn around and say, I know X, they are who they say they are, and they have done what they said they have done. Which is nice, because that means when I sign the form, I'm putting my membership on the line as well. So if he's lying, I'm lying, I'm breaking my professional code of ethics, I get out, I get shoved out as well. Not where I want to be. But that's why, a, that's why an industry certification has value, because it tells an employer something about the individual that maybe a degree or another course cannot communicate as effectively. So how do we do it? Well, you've seen, right? We know there's a big skills gap. We know that we need people who can communicate, who are, who are, who are uh, able to solve problems. We know there's a big skills gap and a big gap in IT as well. We know what we want. Trust me, we know what we want. <laughs> I know what I want. I know. I, 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 I search for, for people to come and work for me within the IC squared team, and I find it tough, and I'm looking for non-necessary infosec roles. But we know what we, what we want, and we know what will actually give people a passport to success in the future. The problem is it's going to take at least three years from today for anything to change at least three years. And go back to my 16-year-old who's doing their GCSEs right now, yeah? If they've ever heard of information security or cyber security and they want to get a career in it and they want to get a degree, well, it's going to be five years of education, 21, before they even get out of the education system. So that's five years from today, assuming, of course, that girls, rugby, boys, whatever it may be, doesn't get in the way and they decide to do something else. So it's a long long process for us to rebuild that pipeline and to get those skills matured across the piece. What we need to do, of course, is build this knowledge right across the educational spectrum. And we're working with you know, people like computers at schools. We're working with the, the uh, professional bodies to get this in. We also need to go out and talk to people. What you do is interesting. I have had some fantastic experiences in information security. I've had some pretty tough ones. But I've had some great opportunities. I've done some really cool stuff, yet nobody ever talks about it. I have yet to meet anyone in information security who goes out and shouts from the rooftops how good their job is. And that's dumb, because if you sit there going, oh, I hope my job is not very exciting, then you ain't going to get people coming in and, do it and following you, are they? They're not going to follow you. And then finally, we need to find different routes to bring people in. One of my best friends, he's the global CISO of a very large company. He has a history degree. And yet he's now in charge of looking after 150,000 people, 300 something thousand computers and everything else. How did he get in the industry? He went the professional cert route. So there are many ways in. And I'll, I'll leave you with a diagram and I'll make sure these slides are available or you can take a photograph. What we need to do is we need to build this in right the way across. But when we start with the GCs, uh, GCSEs and the A-levels and we have the, the, the basics of, of uh, information security in those qualifications, we need to be able through universities, through um, apprenticeships, through companies to be able to offer students a route through this so that when they enter the world of work, they not only have the skills, but they are prepared and ready to mark themselves out as real information security professionals. We have the stuff, we have the material, we have a lot of the willingness. The key now is making sure we make this happen. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting. Any questions? And hopefully, if I press the button properly, there's me. Any questions, Roger? Yes. Are there, any Thank you. Are there any particular universities or courses that stand out to you as being quite focused on 
what you're looking for. Uh, in terms of the information security side, uh, obviously the master's courses with Royal Holloway being the leader, they, they were the first information security masters in the country. Um, so yes, um, Royal Holloway at the master's level, although there are many others that are now catching up. In terms of degrees, lots of people offer what they call computer forensics and, and degrees like that. They're not really necessarily information or cybersecurity degrees. Um, that's why we went to the, the Council of Professors and Heads of Computing, because we, we want to just have it as another thread through everybody's course rather than try and specialize. Because if everybody knows a little, then actually we all benefit rather than having sort of 200 security ninjas who know everything who you can't, who just are stuck because you could, it, it doesn't scale. Um, we are working with companies for, with security academies where they, they, they teach students, they have, they have apprentices, they teach them through that. So we're working with them and universities to get foundation degrees that allow the students to end up with, with a professional cert as well as their foundation degree. We're trying all the routes we can. Um, we are stunningly independent and what we really want to do is just have everybody knowing a bit more because if we do that we'll all benefit good question there. thank you yes oh. uh, just to repeat the question in case you didn't hear it um the, the anecdote about the tech team and the board not accepting a bunch of, um, you know, sandal-wearing uh, <laughs> sandal hippies, in inverted commas. There is a real issue that, that many boards still do not get IT. They still do not get the, the, the understanding around IT and risk. They don't get information security because that's like way down there. But there is also the problem that because of what we do, it attracts a certain sort of person who isn't necessarily ever going to fit into a corporate world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's getting better. As boards are becoming more aware of the, the importance of IT and the importance of the cyber world and being digital, <coughs> and programs like reverse mentoring, which is where 25-year-olds teach the board about social media and how to use Facebook and Twitter and stuff properly, um, that's starting to break down. But it's going to be another half generation, I think, before we see that, 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 that those barriers really disappear. But they're going slowly. Sometimes, of course, you know. Sometimes I've had to go up there. I'm the one wearing the suit, and I've had the team in the jeans and the and, and the pe and the ponytails and stuff. And um, that's fine because uh, you know they look at me as the acceptable face. Well, obviously. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's ways and means around it. The trick is actually, at the end of the day, a bit like Colin was saying, know your audience and talk to them. In, talk to them in a way that gets them. Talk to them in a way they understand. Oh, lady at the back, just one more. Um, yeah, not a long question. Thank you, Adrian. It was really interesting. Um, can you tell us what your thoughts are about the GCHQ accreditation of cybersecurity masters? How do you feel that's going, and is it useful? Thank you. <laughs> right. A um, little bit of history here, because I had a very public falling out with GCHQ in the, in the actual industry press last year about the whole sort of some of their schemes they run. I, I know some people at GCHQ very well, and before Christmas, we, had a, we, got, we sat down in a, in a, in a, in a closed room that was bug free, <laughs> obviously, and had a long discussion. I think GCHQ are doing something that's very important because they're, they're ensuring that the quality of the masters and the PhD teaching the UK offers in cybersecurity is the best it can be, which is great from two angles because one, then they have the cyber ninjas I talked about they can recruit, but secondly, internationally, it places us right at number one. You know, if you want to learn about cybersecurity, you come to the UK. That, I think, so I think that approach is really good. But they are, their focus is on information security. So when I did the undergraduate degrees, notice it's about computing degrees. I want to go much wider. So actually, we kind of work in harness. Um, we also have an unwritten agreement that what I've done, GCHQ won't touch for five years. So we've got five years to make sure that what we were talking about today works before GCHQ decides they want to they sort of take it over. Um, but no, I think they're doing something really important, but I just think they're just, I think they're just a bit too narrow. That's a personal viewpoint, I could be wrong, but I, think, I still think it's a great idea. Yeah, and, and, and to that question, we're gonna show some results oh, yes. in a minute, which most <laughs> will show some of the problems we've got. I think another problem we've got, I've got 
for those of you who know me or don't know, I've got three boys. Uh, the eldest is 11. Um, I've done this, I've been in this industry, rightly or wrongly, since a very young age, maybe 16, 17. And my eldest has always been in this world I'm in. And he's traveled the world with, with my family and everything. And from a young age, in my office at home, when I'm working from home, he's he just in the background doing some of his homework. And he's listening to conference calls I'm on and maybe some of the stuff he shouldn't be listening to because it could be classified whatever, but it doesn't matter. But the interesting thing, he's leaving now to go to big school up to the next year, seven or eight, in September. And he had to write a bio um, last week. And it was a bio of basically what he's done in his life so far and what he wants to do in the future. And his job was, I want to do cyber security and I want to be a forensic investigator and that's what cool he did. Job. His school teacher went, well, what's that? <laughs> yeah, and it's a pretty well-known school. Oops. And they were like, what's cybersecurity? And what, you can do a career in this? And I'm just like, why, really? <laughs> so it's kind of scary, yeah. You know, all right, I know the school teachers are doing an amazing job, but I don't think they, they're aware of this big bubble out there in this big world. And in fact, the, big, the bigger whole IT picture about yeah. mobile app development, yeah. all kind of it's stuff, just, it, it's just part of the education vision. system. But by, it's internet. Yeah. Just, mm. oh, it's the internet and that's yeah. it. So to that point, um, I'll lead you in in a second. Yeah, no problem. Yesterday, uh, just as an experiment, so me and Adrian were collaborating over the past couple of weeks, and we thought, let's do an experiment. People see information security as this one-track mind. You know, it's just information security you know, or cyber security, whatever. Even people in our industry don't realize there's so many subdomains or a skill set required for if you're a managerial or if you're a techie or if you're a networking guy or a software developer. There are t t basic principles you should know. So we said, wouldn't it be good if we presented some exam questions for you know, a global recognized qualification based on a managerial track, a technical track, and a software track, which would resonate to the audience that we've, we've had over the past two days. So we did that. So 24 questions across three domains, managerial, technical, software development, 156 people took part. Okay, 156 people answered questions yesterday. These are some of the questions, I won't go through them all, but for me and Andrew, uh, sorry, Adrian, or anyone in this domain, if you're a managerial or you're a technical <laughs> software developer, yeah. it's the core basic principles. If you do not know the answers to these questions, you shouldn't be near it. You shouldn't even be doing this stuff. Yeah. Okay, and that was, so we particularly took out the easiest questions they were. So, out of 24 questions, okay, eight per domain, managerial, technical, software development, a total of 11 questions were answered correctly. So less than 50% of questions were correct. In order to get a pass mark, you need greater than 75%. Adrian, what do you think of that? All 70%. Uh, yeah. Awful, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> have, okay, having had to help write the questions, I had to go away and check some of the answers. <laughs> but that means that people who claim to know what they're talking about when actually they had to talk about the fundamentals, don't know them. And if you don't know the basics, how the hell can you do the advanced stuff? Because you're building on sand. Yeah? Or are people going to disagree? Disagree with me. Please feel free to disagree with me. And by the way, <laughs> this is kind of interesting in your mm. feedback. The next interesting result, breaking down by domain, managerial, mm -hmm. technical, software development. The managerial people that took part six out of the eight questions they got correct, they got a 75% pass mark. They would have passed. So what we're saying at the moment is managerial, they know what they're talking about. Or they're very good at waving their arms around. And, and how does that <laughs> relate to what you see, Adrian? Um, again, it's interesting because, you know, as, in, as you well know, in any organisation you have, you have the IT guys who are technical, then you have the, the team leaders, you have the pyramid of management. And at the top, normally, there is like a CIO, an IT director. Yeah. The same is true of information security. At the top, there is the, the CISA, the Chief Information Security Officer, whose job is to be managerial, whose job is to set out the strategy and the policy and do the high-level stuff. 
yet here, I'm, I'm guessing we didn't have 156 CISOs or CIOs in the audience, no. yet here the, it would appear that everyone's very good at talking, or at least talking to the management stuff, which is, again, an interesting finding. The next shocking result, technical. Hmm. We may be very technical, may get a network up and running and be able to do VPNs, but out of eight questions which were technically related information security questions for a technical audience, only three were correct. So 38% pass one. That's shocking. Yeah, even I got them right. <laughs> and I'm not a techie. Um, I, that, that, that's one of the worrying ones to me. Because yep. we have loads of technical specialists and people say, I'm a pen tester, I can do X, Y, and Z. Yet when they have to actually prove it objectively, they don't know the answer. And then finally, software development. Thanks for that. Thank you so much for that. That's all I wanted to hear. I don't have to say anything now. Just repeat that one. Yeah. <gasps> Software development. Out of the eight questions, only two were correct. So 25%. I want to go back to my, my, one of my slides where I said one of the biggest problems was configuration and software. If you write crap, it will get hacked. That's it. If you can't write good code, you will get hacked. The biggest one of the biggest problems we have is input validation, right? It's really simple, guys. Write a simple routine that says, if you expect numbers being put in this field, check that only numbers go in the field. It don't take that long. Even I can write that kind of stuff, yeah? One of the questions that was wrong was around input validation. Uh, our jobs wouldn't disappear, but my, our jobs would be so much easier if people wrote better code. This, this is one of my hobby horses, right? Apart from skills and various other things. Lawyers, coders. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. And universities teach software development. Every IT course has a software development module in it. What are they being taught? Sorry, high horse, polemic, stop. So, for, <laughs> so for, for me, we're kind of at the managerial level. We're, get, we're kind of getting it. This is what yeah. it's telling me. Suddenly, you know, that is out there. Manager, we're aware of this security problem now. But the skills gap, it's actually doing the doing in the technical and mm -hmm. making sure security is by default when we're developing code. Yeah. You know, how many people use OWASP? You know, I'm, you know. Actually, how many people are aware of OWASP? How many people actually use it as a Bible? Oh, God. That's, that, 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 was a depressing, that was a depressingly <laughs> small number to start yeah. off with. Oh, well, uh, basically, it's the top 10 things that people screw up when they write web pages. And it says, here's the problem, here's how you fix it, here's some code you can use to fix the problem. The stuff's out there. Sorry, rant, rant. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, mm. takeaway here is security is a big domain, huge domain. Mm. Within those domains, so you could say there's 12 domains of information security. Each domain needs, has a requirement for managerial, technical, and software development. Huge opportunity mm. if you want to get into it. It's cool. For me, I couldn't even dream of a better job. <laughs> it's like a hobby, and I get paid pretty good for it. And it's a hobby, yeah? And it's cool. So, you know, but we do have these gaps. So, and for me, one last thing before we close for coffee is... If you are in one of these domains, managerial, technical, software development, ask your peer, your, your boss, can I get a qualification in this? Because it's going to open up other opportunities for you and it's going to benefit the business you're working in. Yeah. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Adrian. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.